where is the organization today, um, and what is the most exciting thing that you want people to know about AMFAR at this moment? Well, you know, it's actually more than 25 years for us. We recognized 25 years of AMFAR in 2011, but the organization dates back to 1983, when Matilda Krim started a little organization in New York called the AIDS Medical Foundation. And in 1985, there was an organization on the West Coast which was forming called the National AIDS Research Foundation. And Elizabeth Taylor was involved with that organization, as were a few other people. The two organizations decided to merge and become one national organization, which is how AMFAR was born. And that really, that merger really took place in 1986, so about 25 years ago. That's why to this year we're recognizing 25 years of AMFAR. You know, from our, from our very beginning, AMFAR was about investing in AIDS research. It was all about uh, the fact that it, certainly at the time the organization was born, there was a pathetically small response from the U.S. government. And there was a need to, to marshal greater resources and, and make uh, more significant investments in sort of the kind of research that would ultimately bring answers. So. Um, we did that, and really for about 20 years of our existence, we have been doing nothing but that, is investing in research to try to understand and, and, and really get at what HIV is all about. The last five years really have brought uh, significant change, not just to AMFAR, but to the world of AIDS research in general. And, and much of it is because of this growing enthusiasm around our ability to achieve a cure for AIDS. And so I think as, as an organization, we've been not just energized by that, but I think really um, motivated to, to develop new resources to make better investments uh, around the search for a cure. Because we think it's possible. We think it's possible in our lifetime. So today, more than 60% of all of our research grants dollars are going specifically to projects for the cure. You know, a lot of people don't understand what it means to cure AIDS. So can mm. you give us a little bit of 101 AIDS cure? I think the general public thinks of a cure in the way that we probably grew up thinking of a cure. One day you have a disease, the next day you don't, because you've been given something that essentially gets rid of whatever it was. And cures really, you know, really began to be understood in the time of penicillin. You know, you could have a particular infection, penicillin would cure it by killing the infection. So I think in most people's minds, a cure for AIDS would be defined by, you know, killing off the virus that exists in a person's body so they no longer have it. But in, in reality, cures can be much more complicated than that because there are lots of viruses that we all live with that don't cause disease. And as science has progressed, there's an, un, there's an increased understanding that one of the ways we might be able to, to, to cure people without actually having to kill the virus or remove it is to simply stop it from causing disease. And that's where the term functional cure comes in. So that someone may live with the virus a normal healthy lifetime and not have to take drugs and not have to do anything about it because it would basically become a benign virus. It would no longer cause disease. That would be a functional cure. I think ultimately we'd be happy with either one. There's been a lot of hoopla about the O52 study and the you know research that shows that people on treatment can have their risk of transmission reduced by 96 percent. Um, put this into context, it's good news, right? But Very. we have 33.3 million people estimated to be living with HIV globally. We have about six million on, on treatment. When we think about a cure and the necessity for a cure, um, we can't not think of it without thinking about those 27 million people who probably are not going to get treatment, right? So the good news is that treatment works. It can lower the risk of transmission of the virus, but the sticky wicket is that we're not able to fund that access to yeah, care. Yeah. So the cure becomes arguably in that landscape that much more important. Yeah. O52 is an important prevention achievement, right? Because O52 basically tells us that through treatment, you can prevent one person from passing the virus to another. That's great. There are many other important prevention uh, achievements. The, the prevention of mother-to-child transmission, the knowledge that, that um, uh, circumcision can lower transmission, uh, the IPREC study, which showed you could prevent transmissions among gay men if you gave, or acquisition among gay men if you give them you know, uh, a particular drug combination. All of those are incredibly important prevention achievements. But you add all of those things up together, and, and if we had the political will and the resources to implement fully all of them, we could dramatically change the, the trajectory of the epidemic. But that 
ultimately wouldn't do anything for the 33 million people living with the virus today. So the only solution to the epidemic is not just through prevention and effective prevention, but also through dealing with the fact that 33 million people are living with the virus. We have to deal with that. The only way to deal with that is through a cure. That's right. ultimately how we get to the end of that. You saying that we can cure AIDS, possibly even in our lifetime, is almost, it's shocking to people, I think. And it's, it was, you know, when I joined the board a few years ago, it was something that not very many people were willing to say. And we've talked about this a lot. And you've uh, been saying it for a while now. And it looks like it's, we're headed in that direction. What is it like for you to be talking about an AIDS cure in this environment? And are people not believing or supportive? Increasingly, people are supportive. Increasingly, people are enthusiastic and, and often very surprised by where the science is at and what the science is telling us and why, why we believe that we can talk about a cure in, in the kind of confident way that we do today. Five years ago, when we talked about a cure, it was a different environment. It was very scary, um, I have to admit. I, even myself, I was uncomfortable talking about it in that environment because we took an, an enormous amount of criticism for it. Uh, and criticism not just from scientists, but from people in the community who said we were being irresponsible by talking about a cure. But ultimately, you know, we believed that if we, didn't, if we didn't articulate where it is we wanted to go, we didn't believe we could build a roadmap to get there. And everybody was quite co comfortable talking about a vaccine. Nobody had any problem talking about, oh, we're going to develop a vaccine. And there were all kinds of predictions about how quickly a vaccine would come. But mention the cure word, and it was like you had just shot a nun. I mean, it was like, you know, it was really, everybody in the room was mortified that you could utter that four-letter word. And I think that there was a certain amount of, you know, we, we had to break through a certain amount of stigma that surrounded the use of that term for people to understand that we weren't using it irresponsibly. We were really trying to articulate what we believed would ultimately be, you know, a pathway to get there that we needed to shine a light on the problem, we needed to articulate the challenges. And as we did that, and we began to better understand those challenges, I think people became more comfortable with the reality that it's not just doable, but it's actually within our grasp. It's something that can be achieved. When we took a talk about funding for research, there's been um, a much more conservative environment in the last arguably five to maybe even 10 years as we've looked at the economy change. And people talk about the value of death as this you know, space between where independent research gets to and then the amount of money that they need to bring their research to the NIH level. Where are we in terms of research today, and what type of research is AMFAR funding? How do you guys play into the overall schematic of you know, all the major universities globally, the NIH? What are you yeah. doing that's different, and why are you funding it? Yeah. Well, certainly the NIH is the largest funder of biomedical research in the world. But you also have to factor into that equation the amount of research that pharmaceutical companies do, because Big Pharma does a tremendous amount of biomedical research. But their research is very product oriented, right? They're, in a, they're operating, most of them, in a market economy where they have to develop a product that they ultimately bring to market and sell. So they have a very different kind of mandate than the National Institutes of Health does. But what we found when we looked at this was that, first of all, the NIH was spending a pathetically small amount of money on cure research. They're a little late to get to the game most of the time because they're an inherently conservative institution. And there are many ways that we've seen the evidence of that, but, but one of them is that for most of the research that, that NIH funds, there has to be a fair body of evidence which already would, would suggest at least that what you're trying to do could be done. So you need to come to the NIH with a fair amount of evidence just to get a grant. Uh, and what we found was that, in fact, you know, there was this enormous gap in what NIH was doing and what pharma was doing. because. In reality, most pharmaceutical companies are not in the business of finding cures. They're in the business basic of- basic science. Right? Yeah, they don't do basic science research. Mostly they, they absorb that from academia. But most academic research is funded by the NIH, which is inherently conservative by nature. So what we found was there was this gap in between. And what that gap was, and what we've tried to articulate, is a need for a more um, risky kind of research, a kind of research that, that thinks well outside the box, but that's willing to, to gamble a certain amount on ideas around the cure, which 
NIH would never fund or isn't ready to fund for sure. And pharma, because it's not really product focused, isn't going to be in that game either. And, and that's really where AMFAR comes in, is to catalyze the kind of research that we hope ultimately will lead to funding from the NIH, will lead to products at, at, at pharmaceutical companies, because if we're ever going to have the kind of cure that we can develop on a mass scale to deliver to the 33 million people who need it, each of those organizations will have to play a part. And our hope is that we're filling in that little gap that sort of lies in between.